But bird is shit. <laughs> Ernie, I, I am, I am not, I'm not shit. Yes, you I, are, Bert. You're shit, Bert. I'm not. Yes, you are, Bert. Bert shit. Bert is This is perhaps the worst video that I'm ever going to respond to. As if the one boom was bad enough, Under the Mayo has sunk into an entire new low. His video on style meters in video games is one of the most contradictory, hypocritical, and asinine videos I have ever witnessed. This will show you that he lacks the ability to research, he has double standards, and he's a walking contradiction. This video is so bad that I took literal notes on it. So in order to completely debunk all of Mayo's retarded takes on style meters in video games, I'll be going over them one by one. This video will be responding to all his takes on the six video games he talks about, but the vast majority of this video is focused on his takes on Devil May Cry 5 and Ultra Kill, because my god, his points on these two games are baffling. Though, I think I've said enough for this intro. Let's just jump straight into the equivalent of Chernobyl's reactor. The main focus of my channel is gameplay. I do care about the other stuff, but you'll notice that a lot of my videos will only briefly touch on things like visuals, music, story, and all the stuff that isn't directly tied to how the game feels to play. And if you did the slightest bit of research, you would know that Devil May Cry 5 uses dynamic music based on how good you play the game. That's why I generally don't call my videos reviews. I'm not here to examine every aspect of the game equally. Normally this would be an okay thing, just reviewing something based on what you care about, but once we dive deeper into this video, then we'll see why his way of reviewing things is flawed. I'm not going to play a game on multiple consoles to check the performance. I'm here to talk about what I care about, what's most important to me. And when I play a new game, I want it to show me what it's all about. Those first hours of playing are all about feeling out what my options are, how systems work, what the game's asking me to do what's important and what's not. And maybe it turns out to be something I don't personally enjoy, but I can respect when a game is well made even if it's not for me. I like when a game asks me to learn how to play it, punishing me for ignoring its systems, rewarding me for playing well, which can literally be applied to all the games you're talking about and offering a deeper level of engagement once the learning period is passed. Why are you using Mortal Kombat 9 as B-roll? Contextually speaking, if you want to use B-roll for a game, then you should use the right games for that. It just seems as though you're putting in B-roll for the sake of B-roll, rather than use the correct footage that fits the context of what exactly you're talking about. And both concepts of punishment and reward can be very different across different games, and balance varies greatly from game to game. Any game can be broken with enough knowledge and playtime. Some games are broken much sooner than others. But I think what's important is that the game at least make an effort to show you the benefits of engaging with this interesting system, so that when you do get to the point where you're good enough to break the game, you love the system so much that you choose not to ignore them in favor of playing in a dumb, broken way that exploits the game's faults. If a game has done its job, your first playthrough will make you want to play the game better, not worse. The most important playthrough is the first one. Most people only play a game one time anyway, and even then a lot of them don't finish the game. The first playthrough bears a lot of responsibility for impressing the player, because really, the experience of playing a game once and not really liking it, and then replaying it to eventually discover that you do like it, is not very common compared to all the people that simply won't give it a second chance. The stronger your first playthrough is, the more likely it is that the player will become a fan of your game, recommend it to others, replay it, and possibly even learn to master it. So what does this have to do with style meters? Well, of all the ways to encourage players to experiment with your mechanics and play in a fun, interesting way, I think a style meter is by far the worst. I'm not against style meters and rankings and scoring systems, but they should not be a straight up substitute for good gameplay. He's acting as if the style meter by itself is the sole purpose on why people replay games like DMC5, but that's only a part of it. The style meter is not a substitute for good gameplay like you say. It's the cherry on top. The style meter is there for you to feel good when you achieve the highest rank. It's a psychological mechanic where it will give people a dopamine rush, and due to that, they'll attempt to maintain their style and play better. And once they do, the game rewards you for it. Kinda like DMC5, and Bayonetta, and God of War. But no, let's not talk about that. Let's complain about a non-issue instead. Now, good gameplay is hard to define, especially when so many different types of games exist, and people like different things. But generally, engaging in a game's systems should be important for continuing forward in the game. Okay, and style meters literally do just that. 
style meters are there for feedback on how well you're playing, and, in most cases, they reward you for it. For example, in Ultra Kill, the more risks you take and the more unique moves you use against enemies, the more points you get and the higher your rank goes. In DMC5, if you consistently get a very high rank, the game gives you more orbs. So how is that not a good way of engaging players into their game systems to keep playing? Many things like level design, enemy intelligence, coordination, resource management, strategy planning, experimentation, accuracy, quick reactions, multitasking, communication, and all kinds of decision making contribute to the gameplay experience of many of the best games in all genres. All of those points are literally present in DMC5 and Ultra Kill. I mean, for fuck's sake, Ultra Kill literally rewards you for using different types of moves like the Ultra Ricochet, where you shoot at a coin with the railgun. In the worst case of style meter implementation, you would have a game where absolutely nothing matters except for the style meter. You'd have a game where you could mindlessly hit any button you want, and there would be little to no consequence for bad decision making while engaging in the game's other options would give you a high score or ranking. Keep this in mind when he talks about one of the games on his list that he praises. In the best case of style meter implementation, you'd have a game where playing well was important to your success, and you'd come to love the interesting options due to how important they were to learn. And on top of that, there's a score or ranking system to give you bragging rights and unlock more features. No shit. Yeah, Mayo. That is the best case scenario, but just wait until he begins to criticize how particular games use their style meters, and you'll see how he contradicts this point. Video games have existed for like half a century at this point, as have scoring systems. Some of you might be old enough to remember trying to get a high score on the old arcade cabinets at the pizza place. But even if you weren't playing with the goal of getting a high score, which I never was, you still had to play well, or else you'd have to keep popping in quarters. Playing to get a high score, and playing casually, required the same skills. So let's go way back and talk about a game that is as classic as they come. Pinball. Yeah, pinball. What is pinball? This could be called a style meter in a way. Playing enough pinball will eventually get you a high score, and there are lots of people even today who are extremely talented pinball players that get incredibly high scores and do unimaginably impressive tricks on different machines. But you gotta put that stuff aside and think, what is it like the first time you play pinball? When you walk up to that big machine and put a quarter in, having never played a pinball machine before, what are you trying to do? Uh... Play pinball? Is the first thing on your mind the scoring system? Are you studying the machine looking for all the bonus sections and getting worried about maintaining a point multiplier? No, of course not. You're trying to figure out how to play the game. See, this is just you assuming that people play games the same way that you do on their first playthrough. Sure, you could just play it casually and learn its mechanics, but you could also try to aim for that high score. Same thing applies for when you play a game for the first time. Just because you play a game for the first time, that doesn't mean you can't try to aim for a high score. Why can't we do both exactly? Why can't we simultaneously learn how to play the game and aim for the high score? And your point on how people play for the first time just to learn how to play it, you mentioned bonus points, but according to you, you're not aiming for bonuses. That's kind of contradictory for you to say. Like, if you play a game for the first time, wouldn't you also simultaneously aim for bonus points? I mean, bro, this analogy is so stupid. The ball is flying everywhere, it's hard to control the trajectory when you hit it, you're figuring out tactics like holding the ball on a single flipper and then launching it at the right angle, you're just trying not to lose so fast, because when you lose, you gotta put in another quarter. That's your negative reinforcement. It's a tangible consequence. If you screw around and don't play right, you're punished by having to spend more money. Yeah, it does punish you for screwing around. Kinda like some certain games that you criticize later in this video. But enough of that. Let's finally hear what he has to say about said games. And 
we're going to look at six games that do this to various degrees of success and failure. Bayonetta, God of War, Ultra Kill, Ninja Gaiden, Streets of Rage 4, and Devil May Cry 5. I'll be talking about these games in terms of my experience with them, and I'm sure there will be lots of disagreement depending on how much importance you personally place on scoring systems in general. It's not that we will disagree with you, it's just that you're flat out wrong, and we're going to dive into exactly why this is the case. I place no importance on scoring systems if they have no tangible impact on gameplay. And like in the pinball example, I see scores as something to aspire to once the game has done its job in making you fall in love with the way it's designed to be played. A scoring system and or style meter is not a substitute for engaging gameplay. You should be able to remove the entire scoring system and still have a game that encourages dynamic and skillful play through its natural sense of challenge and fun. Once again, the style meter is not a substitute for good gameplay. It's just the cherry on top. I don't know why you insist on stretching the style meter's purpose like it's the very thing that holds one of these games together. When a player picks up Ninja Gaiden for the first time and plays on normal, or god forbid on hard, the end of level style ranking is the last thing on your mind because you're too busy trying not to die. There's so much to learn in the first levels. And then, when you do actually get pretty good and you start doing things like parries, air combos, using orb charges to level up your attacks to cause other enemies to drop even more orbs, you're playing in those fun stylish ways because it has a real benefit during combat. Then, at the end of the level, you get a Master Ninja ranking instead of a Pathetic Ninja Dog ranking. And that's nice. It doesn't really mean anything. Are you retarded? What do you mean it doesn't mean anything? It's your rank based on how good you played. What the game is doing is giving you feedback based on what you did. I mean, you literally compared Ninja Dog to Master Ninja, so surely it should mean something. That just adds onto the whole dopamine release mechanic that I mentioned earlier. Something like a rank in Ninja Gaiden is there to encourage you to play better, and once you do that, it encourages you to maintain it. Now keep this criticism in mind because we'll be going back to it at a certain point. And your stylish, intelligent play has evolved out of your love for the game you're playing. Ninja Gaiden's ranking system is ultimately arbitrary as it adds nothing to the gameplay. But the rank you gain is based off of the gameplay you did on the level. Have you ever taken that into consideration? I mean, gee, it's no wonder why the title Ninja Dog exists, because you did terrible. Another game that does this sort of low-impact style ranking is Streets of Rage 4. You're engaging in the combo system, using defensive specials, pulling off flashy attack sequences, because you're trying to stay alive, and you're going for point bonuses that eventually give you extra lives that you desperately need to make it through the level as you're learning the game, provided you're playing on an appropriately challenging difficulty. Your points per level also add to an overall total that goes towards unlocking additional playable characters. Maintaining a long series of attacks gets the point multiplier to increase, which makes you want to keep your offense going. But if you get hit at any point, the multiplier disappears and you'll lose all the points you would have earned if you had simply allowed the multiplier to expire naturally. Defensive specials drain your temporary health, but long combo attacks recharge that health hit by hit. Grabs are very powerful and have invulnerability frames, and greatly contribute to the point multiplier while you're racking up damage, but they do not recharge health drained by defensive specials. Blitz attacks are very powerful and at times abusable, but have recovery frames that open you up to enemy attacks if used at the wrong time. There's a lot of reasons to engage in the systems of Streets of Rage 4, apart from the style ranking at the end of the level. I love how Mayo will go in-depth to explain how Streets of Rage 4's combat system works, but he did not give that same treatment to Ninja Gaiden. Like, he could have talked about the different weapons, the enemy types, the nimpos, the advanced combat mechanics like just frames and move recoveries. Like, this should tell you that Under the Mayo is heavily biased towards Street of Rage 4. And speaking as someone who doesn't care about rankings, I feel good about achieving an S rank. I feel good about it now because I have already put in my time falling in love with the game and how it plays. What? What the fuck? Wait, so let me get this straight. 
You're telling me that an S rank in Streets of Rage 4 makes you feel good, but not the Master Ninja rank in Ninja Gaiden. You know what we call that, Mayo? Double standards. You see, earlier you criticized Ninja Gaiden's ranking system as arbitrary and it adds nothing to the gameplay. Why not apply that same mentality towards Streets of Rage 4? The S rank in Streets of Rage 4 tells you how good you played overall, which is literally the exact same purpose of the Master Ninja rank in Ninja Gaiden. So now, I'm gonna have to ask you to... Keep that same energy. So there's a sense of satisfaction upon seeing that S. Streets of Rage 4's ranking system is a reflection of the points you gained, but you're not actually aiming for that. You're aiming for high individual level points to gain enough extra lives to survive to the end. And the style ranking at the end simply tells you how well you've done that. And simultaneously, Ninja Gaiden's ranking system is based off the points you gain by going into fights and doing challenges. Once again, proving my point that 1. You lack the ability to research, and 2. You have double standards. You call Ninja Gaiden's ranking system arbitrary despite the fact that Streets of Rage 4 literally does the same thing. See, this is something that I notice when it comes to Under the Mayo's videos. It seems as though he doesn't think before he speaks. Or maybe he doesn't look into his own script, which I'm pretty sure he does do scripts, and if I'm wrong, let me know in the comments. But even then, he doesn't think before he speaks. How does Mayo not realize that the points he makes on Ninja Gaiden completely contradict what he's saying now? Why can this game do that, but not this game? Double standards, ladies and gentlemen. As long as a game has something that Mayo cares about, said game is better than another. It's not a goal in and of itself. Bayonetta actually has individual combat encounter rankings, and then a ranking total at the end of the level. And again, like the other games I just mentioned, it doesn't really mean anything. Because it's not Streets of Rage 4, am I right? It has some nice limitations on it, like decreasing the value of attacks that you overuse, penalizing you for using potions, playing in smart, stylish ways yields you a bunch of halos that you can use to unlock new attacks and items to help you during combat. So there's a decent incentive to try to earn as many as you can. But where I think it fails is in your starting combat options. Bayonetta gives you so many attack options right at the start that not only is it overwhelming to the point where I don't even want to add new attacks to the list as I'm trying to learn this game on a first playthrough, but I also feel like I don't need these extra attacks since the normal difficulty is so easy to mash through anyway. Then how come you never criticize pinball for being complicated? You literally claim that the average person will play pinball for the first time solely for learning how to play it, and not for the highest score. Why not apply that same mentality towards Bayonetta? And speaking of Bayonetta, the whole it gives me too many moves argument is kinda subjective, but he acts as if it's a concrete flaw in the game. Is the beginning moveset overwhelming? Sure, maybe for some people. But like you said, Mayo, when you talked about pinball, your first playthrough is to learn how to play. So what's stopping you from learning Bayonetta's mechanics? And another thing, mashing through Bayonetta is not really possible because there's literally some instances in the game where if you do mash your way through it, that can actually fuck you over really fast. And I'm not even just talking about the boss battles. There's literally normal enemy types that can kill you if you try to mash your way through them instead of playing smart. Lastly, you said earlier that playing stylishly in Bayonetta rewards you more halos for you to unlock moves and items, which gives you the incentive to play more stylishly and unlock as many as you can. Wouldn't unlocking those moves and using them help you even further to getting more halos? Just a thought. Just a playful thought. Fortunately, on the hard difficulty, there's more need to unlock additional moves, so engaging in the style system will get you some more halos. I only wish this kind of pressure existed as an option for new players who wanted it. Here's the thing about Bayonetta. Since the game's highest available difficulty for a new player is pretty damn easy, there's really not much to discourage people from mashing buttons and doing a bunch of random bullshit to pass every combat encounter. Once again, there's literal enemy types in Bayonetta that prevent you from mashing buttons, so that either tells me that you played on easy, or you're just lying about how the game's mechanics work. There are certain enemies that force you to dodge and you cannot activate which time against. 
there's not much pressure on you to play the game well, like there is in Ninja Gaiden in Streets of Rage 4. Uh, no. If you don't play well in Bayonetta, you take damage, and by taking damage, your overall rank decreases, so that is factually incorrect. Also, I love how you just now destroyed your own argument about how Ninja Gaiden's ranks are pointless because you literally just said that Ninja Gaiden pressures you to play better. So there's that risk that players may simply not pick up on the interesting mechanics of Bayonetta because they aren't necessary for beating the game, until you unlock the hard difficulty where they become insanely important and you have to engage in them to beat the game. Even though you said earlier that playing more stylishly rewards you more, so adding in more moves would only improve on that. This logic especially applies to other games like DMC5. That's when a player can truly fall in love with how the game is meant to be played, and you can start caring about a meaningless ranking system. And I think a big reason for Bayonetta's disconnect between stylish play and its actual gameplay design, at least on the normal difficulty, is the recharging health system. If you're not going into Bayonetta immediately with the mindset of, I'm gonna try to get a high style ranking, You'll notice that if you finish a fight with low health, and then go into the next fight and die immediately, you respawn at the beginning of that fight with full health. I think that's a really poor design decision, one that I have regularly criticized in the new God of War games. Why is it bad game design to respawn with full health when Bayonetta literally punishes you for dying by lowering your rank? I mean, I took this screenshot of one of your endgame screens for a reason. In this screenshot, you can clearly see that he took a lot of damage, so ultimately, he just destroyed his own argument by showing this. The whole point you made about how Bayonetta's ranking system doesn't mean anything has been completely destroyed by this very screenshot of one of your endgame screens. Mayo, I'm gonna have to once again ask you to... Keep that same energy. If you can simply refill your health by dying immediately in the next fight and respawning, then you've been robbed of the satisfaction of finishing a fight with high health. Yes, dumbass. Because you died. And when you die in Bayonetta, your overall rank decreases. Do you get it now? It feels great to make it through a tough combat encounter having taken little to no damage, when there's a reason for it. In a game like the original God of War, you had to find health refill stations. So if you left a fight with a lot of health, you were going into the next fight in a good position. It made you want to protect your health and play smart, due to the consequences of leaving a fight with low health. And Bayonetta also has consequences for taking damage. Once again, proving my point that you have double standards. So if I could make one change to Bayonetta, it would be to remove the refilling health mechanic and instead tie health regeneration to the torture attacks you can use once you get a full magic meter. That's something I love about Bayonetta. If you get hit, you lose a lot of your magic meter. That drives you to want to be defensive in combat. Uh, no. Bayonetta always forces you to go on the offensive. The closest thing you can do that's defensive is Witch Time, and even then, Witch Time literally lets you go on the offensive. So once again, that's factually incorrect. And if you can get enough magic to execute a torture attack, you'll do a lot of damage. And I think this should also refill a small amount of health. This would put pressure on you to play better, engage in more of the game's mechanics, and build up your magic meter for the big attacks more often. You'd be protecting your health bar more, and refilling the health bar more as a result. That way you'd feel good about leaving a fight with high health and taking that high health into the next fight. Working for your health, whether it be through combat or exploration, is much more satisfying than getting it back for free, with the only downside being that you negatively affect an arbitrary style ranking. Look, you make a good point about how health regeneration should be, but the ranking system is not arbitrary if it punishes you for screwing up. It's literally one of the points you make in your best case scenario of a game that features a style meter. I mentioned the classic God of War games, so let's get into those. I'll stick to the original game. God of War doesn't have a level-by-level -level ranking system, but it does have somewhat of a combo-style system during combat. It doesn't go any further than some encouraging words popping up on the side of the screen. Technically, that is a ranking system of sorts. God of War's combo system is similar to how games like DMC5 and Ultra Kill pull it off, the only difference being that it shows you the amount of hits, and with every level you reach, you get more orbs. 
What you're looking at is the orbs, since orbs are used to level up your magic attacks and especially your blades, giving you access to higher damage and useful attacks that deal devastating damage or can be used for long combo extensions, thereby giving you even larger orb bonuses. Getting hit causes your combo to end, so there's an incentive to play defensively. But large multi-hit attacks rack up lots of hits for high orb bonuses, so that's an incentive to play risky and offensively. It's a nice balance. You're given a limited number of attacks, and shown immediately that you can unlock more with these red orbs. Let us take a moment to truly appreciate how correct he was about how God of War's mechanics work. Because for some reason, he cannot apply this logic to literally every other game he talks about. Cosmic Disaster Thy Name is under the Mayo Style Meters video. 20 seconds into the game, you're piecing this stuff together. Okay, limited move set, long combos give me orbs, orbs unlock more moves, don't get hit or your combo breaks, got it. Just keep that in mind when he starts talking about DMC5. God of War also offers a hard difficulty setting for new players who want to be held accountable for their combat decisions. There's also the very hard difficulty that you left out of the discussion, because it would go against the argument you made in your DMC5 review where you thought the harder difficulties being locked was a stupid idea. You are not allowed to select hard on your first playthrough, which has a really negative impact on a first-time player's experience if there's someone who likes being challenged. Keep that same energy. Now, God of War is certainly not a perfectly balanced game. There's plenty of things you can exploit, and if it were remade today, I would want to tweak it a bit. But what I appreciate about God of War is that right at the beginning, they show you what the benefits are of engaging in the combo system. And Bayonetta doesn't? The fuck is your point here? Why can't you apply that statement to Bayonetta? Because there's too many movesets at the start? Even if that is true, that doesn't mean you can't learn it. And in my personal experience, I wouldn't have experimented nearly as much with the deeper aspects of combat if I hadn't been shown early on that my performance was directly tied to my ability to upgrade my weapons and unlock new attacks. There's also a certain other game that does this that you'll later criticize for, but we'll get to that in a second. If God of War had an end-of-level ranking system, I would welcome it. No you wouldn't, because by your own logic that would be arbitrary. And I would shoot for a high score because the game already, in my opinion, does a good job of getting me interested in how it's supposed to be played. So why is pinball any different? You're kind of being inconsistent here, Mayo. Are you playing games for the first time to get a high score or not? But don't worry ladies and gentlemen, now we're getting to the real shit. But in order to properly acknowledge this, we must switch to a certain game for B-roll. That's more like it. What I appreciate about God of War's XP-based combat system is what I don't appreciate about Devil May Cry 5's. Mayo, you can't be serious right now. You just admitted that you have double standards. This has to be a joke, right? If this is a troll, then thank god. But if it isn't, then this really is not a good look on you at all. You cannot just say something like that and act like you don't have double standards. In that very sentence that you just spoke, you said that it's okay when God of War does it, but not when DMC5 does it. That's very much biased of you to say, and it's fucking baffling. All I can do is speak from my experience. I bought Devil May Cry 5, the game started with only basic moves like God of War, so I was inspired to unlock more, but it gave me a hundred thousand orbs at the start that I was able to use to unlock all the attacks that I needed. Alright, so first of all, I'm gonna assume that you bought the 100,000 orb microtransaction, because there's no way that you got that many orbs at the start of the game without buying that, which makes your argument disingenuous. And secondly, what makes this argument of yours even more disingenuous is that 100,000 orbs is nothing compared to how many you need for literally anything else. Not to mention that you're only on the abilities tab when you're on Don Dante's menu, there's an entire list of things you can unlock besides in the abilities tab. Mayo, you're overlooking some pretty important details here. So as a new player unfamiliar with this franchise, I was fighting enemies and seeing this style meter that gave me an orb bonus, but I didn't feel like I needed orbs anymore. Bullshit. In your own footage, you only have over 40,000 orbs. You're not rich, my guy. Also, adding on to how 100,000 orbs is nowhere near enough for all the upgrades and abilities, the only character you showed for this was Dante. What about characters like V or Nero? You're once again overlooking some pretty important details. I already had everything I needed. 
And the highest available difficulty is normal, which is laughably easy in most cases. Now, here we have Mayo complaining that DMC5 has locked difficulties. And in his DMC5 review, the reason why he hates this is because it's a bad practice towards people that are looking for a challenge. And I say to that, I think the point of the locked difficulties is that that's a reason on why you can keep coming back to the game and playing. After you beat the game on normal, you get the harder difficulty, and once you beat that, you get another challenge. It's challenges upon challenges in DMC5, and it gives you a huge sense of replay value. And what exactly is wrong with that? What's wrong with the game giving you an incentive to keep coming back and playing? There's so much content and challenges in DMC5 that it's honestly revolutionary. And the harder difficulties being locked only gives you a reason to come back once you unlock them. But no, I guess that's a bad thing according to Under the Mayo. Fucking stupid. So right from the outset, DMC5 sabotaged its introduction when it was supposed to be showing me the importance of stylish play methods. Yeah, because you bought a microtransaction, you moron. I did eventually unlock a hard difficulty and I started to feel more pressure to play in stylish and creative ways, but it was out of a need for survival, not because of a style ranking that, at that point, meant very little in terms of gameplay, except for the free sin trigger attack for Dante. DMC5 style meter is not useless in any way. First of all, the higher your rank on the style meter is, the more orbs you get. The amount of orbs you get is also factored by what enemy type you kill. You clearly haven't spent all your orbs on all the upgrades based on your own footage. On top of all that, it feels very easy to get a high style meter just by doing random stuff and spamming moves. Uh, no. DMC5 style meter has a function where it prevents you from getting style points when you spam certain moves, so that is once again factually incorrect. Unlike Bayonetta, where the hard difficulty starts with a fresh save option, DMC5 starts you with all the unlocks from the normal playthrough, so you don't need to worry about engaging with the style system to unlock necessary abilities. Oh yeah, that's another thing, Mayo. If you hypothetically could start DMC5 on a harder difficulty rather than normal, you would not beat the game. Period. The reason why is because of how the game gives enemies major buffs on harder difficulties. If DMC5 didn't carry your purchases from the previous playthrough to the new playthrough on a harder difficulty, then you would essentially be soft locked, so that's why the difficulties are locked. Thanks for further proving my point that you don't know how to research. You already have them. Clearly you don't. Fortunately, when you get to higher difficulties, the game opens up and there are real benefits to playing in more interesting ways. And it has nothing to do with getting a high ranking. Yes it does, because once again, if you spam the same moves over and over, your rank would not go up. Although, another thing is that you brought up the difficulty in this part. You do realize that difficulties don't affect how the style meter works, right? Regardless of what difficulty you play on, the effects of the style meter remain the same. Quit with your misinformation, Mayo. I made it far enough to eventually see the depth of DMC5, but I couldn't blame someone for playing the game once and dropping it, feeling like it's a mindless button masher, because that's how it insists on presenting itself, even if ultimately it ends up being something far from it. Again, it's not for button mashers, especially on the harder difficulties. Which brings me to Ultra Kill. Oh boy, here he comes. <sighs> okay. Let's keep fucking going. A game that proudly promotes itself as being inspired by Devil May Cry. And I'm sorry, but I think this is a really poorly implemented style ranking system. I don't think Ultra Kill is a bad game. I think it's a decent, cool game that has some fun stuff if you really go looking for it. Says the guy who made an entire board game purely made to mock Ultra Kill's mechanics. But this isn't about the games overall. This is about the connection between their ranking systems and their gameplay. First of all, like DMC5, and honestly like God of War, it has the same exact problem of your starting attack option being way too powerful. No, it's, it's not that powerful. And the only reason you say that is because of the charge shot. I would like to tell you that by using the pistol only that you'd limit all the points you get on the style meter, but I don't think he understands how these types of games work anymore. Also, DMC5 having an overpowered starting weapon? What are you smoking? None of the starting weapons in DMC5 are overpowered. They are nothing compared to what you can unlock later on, especially when you take the unlockable difficulties into consideration. Quit lying, Mayo. An infinite ammo pistol that charges into a multi-hitting railgun shot, 
and combined with your insane triple dash mobility options and super easy health refill, it ends up trivializing all the encounters in the early levels, and even later levels. So if you're not playing this game with the expressed goal of getting a high ranking for fast completion time and weapon style, the default pistol is the solution to every problem, so who cares about these other weapons? Aside from this dude's gameplay making me want to cut my eyes apart with a pair of scissors, I love how he tries to prove his point by using the pistol on the weakest enemies in the game. Like, oh yeah, trust me bro, the pistol is overpowered in ultra kill simply for the fact that you could one-shot cannon fodder. Like. This is so disingenuous, it's almost baffling. Like, why don't you try using the pistol only on things like the Mind Flayer or the Cerberus or even the bosses like King Minos, V2, and Gabriel? I bet you money that you're gonna die a lot just by using that weapon alone in those certain cases. You might say, well, getting a high ranking gives you extra credits to unlock alternate versions of future weapons. No, I'd say that by aiming for the highest rank on all levels and by doing the challenges, you'll be rewarded for much more than just alternate mods for the weapons. There's also a sense of exploration that you can do in these levels to find secrets, and I'm not just talking about the secret orbs. There's secret weapons and a lot of easter eggs. Did you know that? I bet you fucking didn't. Even Ultra Kill did a better exploration than Doom Eternal. Although, now that you mention it, getting the highest rank on the end of levels is not a bad excuse. And before you tell me it is, I could apply that same logic to Streets of Rage 4. But yet, you feel good about getting a good rank on that game, but not Ninja Gaiden and Bayonetta for some stupid contradictory reason. But next, he does make a good point about how Ultra Kill's mods are too easy to unlock, so I'll be skipping that too. To which I would say, even if you play like an idiot, you'll gain enough points to unlock them because they don't cost hardly anything. It's not like God of War is, or how Bayonetta and Devil May Cry try to be, where they show you a bunch of moves that you really want to unlock, and they're dangling them in front of you, tempting you to try to get more points. No, they are gradually presented to you, and by the time they're available, you already have enough points to buy them even if you haven't been playing very well. And again, who cares about these weapon upgrades? The pistol charge shot is working just fine. Yeah, on literal cannon fodder. Now use it on tougher enemies and bosses. Also, didn't you say that Streets of Rage 4 has an abusable mechanic? You never really imply that that's a bad thing. So the thing you're criticizing Ultra Kill for, I could apply that same argument to Streets of Rage 4, since you never implied that was a bad thing. And because of the terrible weapon balance, infinite ammo, insane mobility, and super simplistic AI, you aren't pushed into the interesting mechanics through actual gameplay. You don't end up playing in creative and smart ways just because you're trying to survive, eventually resulting in a high style ranking as a natural consequence. First of all, the weapons being unbalanced is not really true. While they do have some really useful techniques and are capable of one-shotting, well, weak enemies, they aren't spammable. I've seen someone say that the projectile boost on the shotgun is very overpowered and spammable, but they never considered that that ability has a cooldown of how many projectile boosts you can make, so that gives you a window of opportunity to switch your weapons. There's also an entirely different mechanic called shotgun swapping, where if you combine that with projectile boosting, your combos are going to be super deadly, and the style meter will greatly reward you for that. Some have also said that the malicious mod on the railgun is greatly overpowered, but once again, that weapon has a cooldown as well, which once again, encourages you to switch weapons. Even the charge shot on the pistol, the very weapon you are criticizing for being overpowered, has a short cooldown. Why not take that to your advantage and switch to another weapon that has a nice technique? Hell, I learned something while recording this video. Apparently, you can fire a grenade from your shotgun, switch to the malicious mod on the railgun, and essentially what that does is make a nuclear explosion. That's cool! I never thought of combining the shotgun's grenade with the malicious railgun until I heard about it. This game has so much depth into its mechanics and it's fucking amazing. I bet Mayo didn't know any of these mechanics existed, because he solely focuses on how powerful the pistol supposedly is in his eyes, even though in most of his footage he's using it on cannon fodder to prove his point. Truly a thought-provoking argument, Mayo. Your argument is so bad that it made me discover a mechanic in Ultra Kill that I didn't even know existed until now. Also, resulting in a high style ranking as a natural consequence? I'm sorry, but what? That's an oxymoron if I ever heard one. Why is a high rank a consequence? I could apply that same logic to Streets of Rage 4. You literally admitted that one of the mechanics in that game is abusable. God, this video is so fucking bad. The best way for a new player to survive shouldn't be the dumbest, most boring thing you can do you should at least present some kind of motivation not to do that. The game does motivate you to not stick to the pistol. There are certain moves you can pull off that will affect the style meter and how many points you get, like... <clears throat> 
ultra ricochets, projectile boosts, friendly fire, ground slamming, interruptions, the nuke mechanic that I mentioned earlier. Can you do any of those just by using the pistol? No? Didn't fucking think so. Imagine if Ultra Kill had limited ammo. No. And using different weapons caused your ammo to refill. Or what if maintaining a high style meter gave you a damage buff, making higher difficulties more manageable? Wouldn't that make you complain more about how overpowered the pistol is or how unbalanced the weapons are? Why would you want the style meter to create a damage buff when you claim that the starting weapon is too overpowered? Mayo, you're once again being inconsistent with your points here. Or maybe the style meter tied into a health regeneration system. The game already has a health regeneration system. Just get close to enemies and damage slash kill them. That's it! Or maybe the starting weapon could be really crappy, and the only way to get better weapons was by getting enough points exclusively through the style system. Motherfucker, you just complained that the starting weapon is overpowered, but now you want the developers to add in a weapon that's underpowered for the sake of being underpowered until you unlock the weapons worth using? You really want the devs to pull a Doom 2016 where the pistol was fucking useless if you got literally any other weapon? That's terrible game design, Mayo. Something you are currently advocating. There's so many things you could do to make the stylish mechanics actually mean something. Instead, the ranking system ultimately feels arbitrary. So a game that features specific boosts to your style meter based on what mechanic you use is arbitrary? Your definition of arbitrary is quite flawed, Mayo. Then again, that's been proven multiple times while he talked about Ninja Gaiden, DMC5, and Bayonetta. Man, Mayo does not know how to... Keep that same energy. And I'll admit, now that I know how to play Ultra Kill after spending hours in it, if I play with the goal of trying to get through the levels as quickly as possible and get a high ranking, I end up having a lot more fun. But the game does a very poor job of getting you to that point or that mentality. Sounds like a skill issue, my guy. Maybe if there was a timer to put a lot of pressure on you to beat fights quickly or you die, something to actually make you care about beating it quickly, I don't know. Because in its current state, if it didn't have a ranking system, Ultra Kill would just be this insanely broken game with no reason to engage in all the available mechanics. Wait, so if Ultra Kill did not have a style meter, you'd criticize it even harder for being a broken game with no purpose? Man, it's almost like Ultra Kill fits right into your best case scenario of a game that features a style meter. But no, it's just a mindless shooter. How can people be this fucking stupid? There's no way that this video is legit. I swear, the only saving grace this video could have is if we find out that Mayo was trolling the entire time, which is entirely plausible. Unlikely, but plausible. And I think that's a poor way to design your gameplay, I'm sorry. Maybe this stuff would fly 20 years ago, but these days you gotta do more. Think about it for a minute, if you're an Ultra Kill player. If you had limited ammo that automatically regenerated very slowly, but maintaining a high style meter caused ammo regeneration to get significantly faster, then you would have a game where new players who aren't any good would actually have an in-game reason to get good and aim for a high style meter. And players who are already good would be unaffected, because they're already maintaining high style meters, and they'd basically be regenerating the infinite ammo which they already have right now. It's a win-win. Ultra Kill needs something like this. Without some kind of incentivization system, there's no reason for new players to engage in your style meter. Do I really have to repeat the point that I made against Mayo's argument about infinite ammo in Ultra Kill? I really don't feel like it, so what I'm going to do is replay a clip from my response to Mayo's Ultra Kill quote-unquote review, and leave it at that. Well, Mayo, that's an interesting argument, but the more I think about it, we have to dive into what kind of game Ultra Kill is. You could say that the weapons are unbalanced combined with the fact that you have infinite ammo, but you have to realize that Ultra Kill's style of gameplay is not exactly the same as Doom Eternal's, which we will get to later. But why does Ultra Kill have infinite ammo? Well, we have to look at it in a gameplay perspective. You see that scoreboard on the right? What does that mean? It's your style meter. The same kind of style meter that Devil May Cry uses. And how do you use it effectively? By constantly swapping your weapons, using all of your abilities, taking risks, and just going nuts overall. That's what the game wants you to do. You do that, you will get so much better at the game, and you will keep that score on your style meter very high. 
Now, if you were to hypothetically add in something like ammo management when it comes to this style of game, you would hinder the style of meter's purpose and limit yourself more than the game already does. The nail gun and rail gun already have their restrictions. They have to recharge in order to effectively use them. Same thing with the coin toss on the revolver. The game wants you to take risks and go guns blazing, whereas in Doom Eternal, you have to manage all of your resources while fighting enemies. Manage your health, armor, and ammo. Ultra Kill says, fuck that. Go fucking nuts and try not to die. That's Ultra Kill. Yeah, I know the wash machines blow all with the cat. Hey, Abel. Abel. Yeah, one moment. Um, what are you doing right now, man? I'm talking with my dad. Well, not anymore. Krom, take his phone. Yeah, no, dude. Yo, what the f- Alright, so me and Krom have designed this awesome brand new game. This is very good. Check it out, man. Yeah, um, uh, you wanna try it? Okay, so, uh, Chrome, explain the rules. Alright, so, you start here. You got it? Okay. Do you understand? Yes, I understand. Alright, so you start here. Here? Yeah, so, you start here, and you're gonna take your character all the way to the end. Got it? That's it? Yep. Yeah, that's, that's it. it. Go. Okay. Yeah. Whoa 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 whoa, 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 what's going on? Uh, Dude, what, what, what are you doing? I just went to the end like you told me. <laughs> Bro, <laughs> what did I do wrong? Uh, well, why did you just go to the end? Because you told me to do that. But, but what about the style points? The style points? Yeah, bro, the style points. You gotta go to the other parts to get the points. Yeah. Do I need those points to reach the end? Well, no. So... You can unlock new moves. New moves? I can just go straight to the end. But that's boring. Then you made a boring game. Look, you can't just take a direct path to the end, okay? You gotta make the game fun. Isn't that your job? Well, look, dude, if you get a high point score, then you can show all your friends. I don't have any friends. Look, man, uh, just play it again, and this time try to get the style points, okay? Oh, okay. okay, he's got a 2x multiplier. Yeah. Oh, Alright, he's keeping it going. Oh, That's sick. nice. Harry, bro. Nice. nice. Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah. Dude, 4x multiplier? Ooh. That is sweet. Oh, man. It's a good combo he's got going, really. Oh, look at all those style uh, Oh, points dude, savage Holy combo. Shit. Look at all those points. That's so cool. Yeah, come on. Let's go. Alright, he's, go, he's near go. the end. He's almost there. Go. Yeah. Yes! 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 yes. Woo! Awesome! All right. Man, yes. Woo! Dude, um, how do you feel? What is wrong with you people? Whoops. Jesus. Don't worry about it, man. He, he just doesn't get it. This is going to sell millions. I can feel it. That was the most painfully unfunny skit I have ever witnessed in the history of YouTube. Not only was your little board game a false equivalency to all the games you've covered, especially Ultra Kill, but it was nothing but sheer absolute torture to watch and listen to. Your skits make Angry Joe look like God. Your skits make Channel Awesome funny. Your skits are so bad that I'm convinced that's why the war between Russia and Ukraine started. That's how bad your skit is, and that's how painfully unfunny you all are. That was nothing but sandpaper across my face, and because of that, please consider the following. Delete the skit, 
cancel your board game, and write me a 500-word essay on why your skit was terrible and apologize. If you fail to meet these requirements within the next 48 hours, your mere existence will be considered a war crime on this channel. You should be ashamed of yourself for creating such an abomination of a skit and an abomination of an analysis on style meters. <sighs> Also, you do realize that no matter what you do in Ultra Kill, you can still get style points, right? Yes, even if you only use the pistol. My theory is that you found out that Ultra Kill has one specific level where you can just skip every encounter and go full on pacifist, and then you took that level and turned it into a board game. That's some nice cherry picking you did there. If I had to grade all these games based on their relation between ranking systems and gameplay, it would go like this. Ninja Gaiden, C+. The game does a good job of pushing the player into stylish and intelligent play, especially with the challenging normal difficulty and the option of a hard difficulty for new players. But the ranking system provides no benefits whatsoever, and there's no in-game style meter to keep track of how well you're doing. You do make a fair point about Ninja Gaiden not having an in-game style meter, but that still doesn't make the end-game rank arbitrary. It's literally there to tell you if you did good or bad at a specific level. God of War, B+. A limited attack list combined with combo-based orb bonuses provides solid incentive for engaging in stylish play, and the option of a hard difficulty ensures that new players can be pushed into playing smart, making them want to get more orbs through the combo system to upgrade their character faster to meet the challenge. However, weapon balance is an issue that makes it too easy to ignore the combo system once you figure out cheap tactics, and an end-of-level style ranking would be very welcome. Too bad you don't mention the unlockable very hard difficulty I mentioned earlier, cause you don't want to contradict one of your biggest gripes with DMZ5. Also, how does God of War get a B plus even though you literally criticized it for having several exploitable mechanics? Shouldn't it get a D or C minus if that's the case? Because that's the same reason why you gave Ultra Kill a low score. Bayonetta, B minus. A detailed style meter system combined with expensive purchases in the store provide a decent incentive for engaging in stylish play and it helps that it's so easy to freestyle given how smooth Bayonetta's combat feels. The loss of magic upon being hit inspires defensive play, especially on high difficulties. However, an overabundance of combat options at the beginning detracts from the need to buy new attacks. I don't think I need to explain why that point is fucking stupid. It's a subjective thing, but he points it out as a concrete flaw. You cannot say that something is objectively bad if it only affects you and not someone else and an easy health refill system discourages smart play by removing tangible consequences from the experience. Dying in Bayonetta does not equal an easy health regen system, you fucking brainlet! And the first playthrough is set to normal by default, which makes the game too easy. Fortunately, the game requires smart stylish play on higher difficulties, and the ranking system then serves as a personal goal set for players who love the game and want to master the combat without using special items. And as a nice bonus, if you get an average platinum score upon completion, you unlock an additional playable character. That's great. Ultra Kill D Fun gameplay emerges when you're pushing yourself towards high rankings, but the game really fails to provide solid in-game reasons for doing so. I literally just explained to you why that is factually incorrect. The style meter in Ultra Kill rewards you different kinds of boosts whenever you use different mechanics, and if you're going to use that point as an example of a piss poor defense, then I can apply that same logic to Streets of Rage 4, because you suck that game's tit in this video. Currency earned from high rankings feels pointless as new weapons are unlocked easily through even mediocre play, an overpowered starting weapon, infinite ammo, and uninteresting AI renders other weapons and tactics unnecessary even on higher difficulties. Let me ask you something, Mayo. You bring up uninteresting AI, yet you give no example. So I'm gonna do you one better and explain why you're wrong by criticizing a game that you hold so close to your heart. Mayo, you like Doom Eternal, right? I do too. It's a very neat game. However, the AI in that game is very uninteresting. All of them are just idiots that like running at you except for a few bosses here and there. I'll give you an example. The Hell Knight. He does nothing but charge at you 24-7. That is so uninteresting and it could be more than that. Now you could say that the Hell Knight was designed that way to be up close and personal. Well then, what I'd say to that is, that doesn't stop you from criticizing Ultra Kill's AI. Cause, you know an enemy in Ultra Kill that's literally the same thing as the Hell Knight? The Swords Machine. 
that enemy was designed to be up close and personal, so by your logic, the Hell Knight in Doom Eternal is also bad AI design. But I know for a fact that you'll disagree, because you are Doom Eternal's lapdog. And the in-game style meter doesn't affect moment-to-moment -moment combat. But it is an incentive to experiment with your weapons, since it gives you giant boosts based on what abilities you do, yet you probably don't even know that since you have the attention span of a goldfish. Devil May Cry 5, C. Sharing some of the same problems of Bayonetta and Ultra Kill, DMC5's ranking system largely feels arbitrary, especially when the first playthrough is stuck being on the normal difficulty which is very easy to mash through. Once again, DMC5's harder difficulties are locked for two reasons. One, for replay value, and two, if you started on those difficulties without upgrades and new movesets, you would be soft locked. The game gives you 100,000 orbs to unlock all the attacks you need, which is either from a microtransaction or you bought the deluxe edition, making the orb bonus from the style meter pointless. And the style meter is very easy to manipulate through random mashing and spamming. However, similar to Bayonetta, once the game is played on higher difficulties, stylish play does emerge naturally, which is then reflected by high rankings. I love how you claim that you can exploit DMC5 by mashing buttons while simultaneously showing gameplay that contradicts that. You can very clearly see that his style meter is being drained because he's repeating the same move over and over. Maybe don't destroy your own argument with your own footage. Streets of Rage 4, A-. Five available difficulty options for new players, beautiful synergy between life-draining defensive specials and life-regenerating combo attacks, invulnerability frames during grab animations, a point system based on overall damage and not number of hits, the addictive risk-reward of trying to maintain a long combo when getting hit means you could lose everything, and the goal of gaining extra lives through the point system. All of this makes smart, stylish play the default way to play Streets of Rage 4. Wow, that's the incentive of playing stylishly? I wonder if there's other games that have this incentive, but in completely different ways. You know, the same games that you criticize for doing? The end of level ranking system is the cherry on top that reflects how well you've engaged in the game's systems. Which makes your criticisms towards Bayonetta's and Ninja Gaiden's end of level ranking systems make you look like a hypocrite, because you have double standards. You're saying it's fine when Streets of Rage 4 does it, but not when Bayonetta or Ninja Gaiden do it. Fucking stupid. As evidenced by the point total, and overall points contribute to character unlocks and a sense of progression. The only thing keeping this from being an A+, is maybe making the achievement of S rank give an additional bonus to something, and the game needs an S plus rank with much stricter requirements. By your own logic, an S plus rank in Streets of Rage 4 would be arbitrary, because you would be giving the player too much reward for doing decent, and seeing as you pointed out that this game has an abusable mechanic, that makes your solution all the more contradictory. You know what, let's throw one more in there. I talk about Resident Evil a lot on this channel. So, did you know Resident Evil has a ranking system? Yeah, you're graded based on how fast you beat the game and how many times you saved. The first time you play, you don't even know about it. You engage in the systems of survival horror, exploration, resource and inventory management, puzzle solving, enemy avoidance, because that's what's necessary to survive. And then, expressing your mastery of those systems earns you a high ranking at the end after you've already fallen in love with how the game plays because it was required to play like that to beat the game in the first place. That is some bullshit. Resident Evil's ranking system is solely based on how fast you can complete the level, not by doing smart decisions. So by your own logic, Resident Evil's ranking system is the most arbitrary feature. The fact you don't realize this is scary. So those are my thoughts on style meters and ranking systems. I had originally planned to make this a longer section in my original Challenge Matters video, but I decided it was better suited for its own video. So this works as an extension of that theme, and that's why I'm repeating some of my points and examples from that video. I appreciate all of you taking the time to hear me out on this. Honestly, it's not like I have a problem with people who go crazy over style meters. If you play a hack and slash game or whatever it is, and all you care about is styling on enemies even if the game is super easy. Well, I'm happy for you, but I really do think the games can be more than that. They can be more and still offer you the same stylish satisfaction you like so much. I know it because I've seen it. Thank you for watching this video. You can check me out on Patreon. I've got a merch store with lots of cool shirts and stuff. And now you can buy your own game board to play awesome style quest with your friends at home. Check it out.
I would find more enjoyment from drilling holes on both of my feet rather than buy a piss poor board game that was created solely to mock Ultra Kill's mechanics. The fact you even thought of selling it makes you the equivalent of Mr. Krabs. You're a scammer. I'm not buying your shitty merch because your merch is not worth buying due to you being a giant hypocrite and blatant liar. And with that, Mayo's dog shit video ends. I don't know how there can be a worse video than this. This video was honestly torture. Pure, unadulterated torture. If Kamara from Warhammer 40k were turned into a YouTube video, this would be it. This is the worst video I've ever watched on YouTube, and that's saying something. Never before have I had this much hatred over a single video merely existing on this platform. It's worse than the One Boom, Slick Tactics, Jim Sterling, and Harmon Smith's videos combined. That's how bad this video is. I'm fucking done. I'm going to sleep, and I better wake up to having more subscribers, because I had to sacrifice my sanity in order to respond to this shit. Hope you guys liked this video. Be sure to subscribe, because I need fucking clout.